Chapter Twelve of Two Thousand Miles Below by Charles Willard Diffin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dreams. The black curtain of unconsciousness which descended so quickly upon Rawson was not easily thrown off. For hours, days, or weeks, he never knew how long he lay in the citadel of the Reds. It was to wrap him around. Nor was his waking a matter of a moment. Many and varied were the impressions which came to him in times of semi-consciousness, and which of them were realities and which dreams he could not tell. He was being tortured with knives, lances tipped with pain, that dragged him up from the black depths in which he lay. Dimly he realized that his clothes were being stripped from him, and that the piercing knives were none the less real for being only the touch of hands and rough cloth upon his blistered body. Then from head to foot he was coated with a substance cool and moist. The pain died to a mere throbbing, and again he felt himself sinking back into unconsciousness. There were other visions, many others, some of them plain and distinct, some blurred and terrifying to his fevered brain, trying vainly to bring order and reason into what was utterly chaotic. Once a bedlam of shrieking voices roused him. He tried to open his eyes, whose lids were too heavy for his strength, and by that he knew he was dreaming. Yet from under those lowered lids he seemed to see a wild medley of red warriors, their faces blotched and ghastly in the green light of their weapons. They were carrying a charred body, which they threw heavily upon the floor beside him, as if to compare the two. He saw the face which the flames had not touched, the face of Jack Downer, Downer, the sheriff of Cocos County. His sandy hair had been scorched to the scalp. Dreams, and the steady beat of metal-shod feet of marching men. He saw them passing some distance away. The repeated thud-thud of metal on stone echoed maddenly through his brain for hours. Dreams, all of them. And once there came to him a vision which, beyond all doubt, was unreal. Silence had surrounded him, for what seemed hours, not one of the Red Mole men had come near. And then, in the silence, he heard whisperings and the sound of stealthy feet. And for a moment, the same white figure that had met him in his flight stood where he could see. Only the merest trace of dim light relieved the utter darkness of the room. The girl's figure was ghostly, unreal. Yet he saw the dull sparkle of jeweled breastplates against her creamy white skin. Loose folds of cloth were gathered about her waist. Her golden hair was drawn back except for vagrant curls that only accentuated the perfect oval of her face. There were others with her, dim shapes of men. How many? Rawson could not tell. They looked down at him, whispering softly, excitedly among themselves, but their words were like nothing he had ever heard. For an instant, Dean felt his stupefied mind coming almost to wakefulness. Phantom figures, ghostly and unreal, but the faces were human, and the eyes looked down upon him pityingly. He tried to rouse himself, tried to call out, then settled limply back, for the girl was speaking, or he was catching her thoughts. It seemed almost that he heard her whispered words. They take him to Guevaro, to the lake of fire which never dies. Gore told me he overheard their plans. But by the mountain I swear. Then footsteps echoed in a far-off passage, and the white ones vanished like drifting smoke. Dreams, all of them. Yet the time came when Dean knew that he was awake. He knew that further experiences awaited him in this demoniac land. Again red guards came. The wicked breath of their weapons filled the great room where Rawson had been with green, flickering light. Dean, dragged to his feet, was unable to stand. One of the giant yellow workers came forward at a whistled order and held him erect. Another brought a bowl carved from rock crystal and filled with a liquid golden-green with reflected light. He put it to Rawson's lips, and with that first touch, Dean knew that he must have been filled with a burning thirst beyond anything he had ever known. He gulped greedily at the liquid, drained the bowl to the last drop, 
then marveled at the thrilling fire of strength that flowed through him. Wine, he thought, wine of the gods or devils. He came to himself with a start. He knew that he was naked and that his body was encased in a coating of stiff gray plaster. It was this that prevented his arms and legs from flexing. Another order, and the giant worker picked him up in his arms and carried him where the others led to a distant room. A stream trickled through a cut in the rocky floor. At the center of the room was a pool. Unable to resist, Dean felt the giant arms toss him out and down. The water was warm. At its first touch, the hard plaster melted like snow. Sputtering and choking for breath, Rawson came to the surface. He found he could move freely. Then reaching hands hauled him out upon the floor, and, through all his dread, he found time to marvel at his own firm muscles and the healthy white of his skin that had been seared and blistered. He obeyed when the Red Guards pointed and motioned him into a dark passageway. He tried to keep up with them as they hurried him on. Evidently his pace was too slow, for again the big worker picked him up, swung him into the air, and seated him firmly on one broad shoulder, and, with red guards ahead and behind them, hurried on. To find himself a child in the hands of this big yellow man was disconcerting. To be calmly lugged off was almost humiliating. No one who was not a good sport could have grinned as Rawson did at his own predicament. Not exactly a triumphal procession, he told himself, then his lips set grimly. They've got my gun, he thought, and now, whatever comes, all I can do is stand and take it. Still, they saved my life, but what for? Always the way led downward, and Rawson, perched on his strange half-human steed, let his gaze follow up every branching tunnel and widespread cave. Not all of these were as dark as the broad thoroughfare they followed. In some, strange lights glowed, and Rawson saw weird, towering plant growths that yellow workers were harvesting. Life, life everywhere, and seemingly this underground world was endless. Troops of red warriors passed them, upward bound. The dancing flames of their weapons, where occasional ones were in action, glowed from afar. They bobbed and waved like green fireflies as the molemen came on at half a run. And this means trouble up top, he thought. There's going to be hell to pay up there. But workers, fighters, everyone they met, stood aside to let the Red Guard pass. Again Rawson heard the strange word or call that had come to him in the Temple of Fire. One of the guides would give a whistling call that ended in the same strange shrill cry of fee e all and instantly the way was cleared. A wild journey, incredible, unreal. Rawson, as he met the countless staring white eyes of the creatures they passed, found his thoughts wandering. He had had wild dreams, surely. This was only another in that succession of phantom pictures. Then, seeing the cold, implacable hatred in those staring eyes, he would be brought back with sickening abruptness to a full knowledge of his own hopeless situation. Gavaro, the lake of fire which never dies, what was it the white ones had said? But no, that certainly was a dream, like that other, in which he seemed to see the charred body of a man, the sheriff, who had called to see him at his camp in Tana Basin. Dreams, reality, his brain was confused with the wild kaleidoscope of unbelievable pictures. He was suddenly aware that, through it all, he had been mentally tabulating their route, remembering the outstanding features when there was light enough to see. He knew that unconsciously his mind had been thinking of escape. Wilder than all the other visions, he had been picturing himself retracing his route, alone, free. He did not know that he had laughed aloud, harshly, hopelessly, until he saw the curious eyes of his red guard upon him. Yes, he told himself in silent bitterness, I could find my way back, if... The guard had swung off from the great tunnel, which must have been one of the main thoroughfares of the Mole Men's world. They crowded through a narrower passage, and again Rawson found himself in one of the great high-ceilinged caves, like the others he had seen. But unlike the others, this was brightly lighted. 
massive limestone formation. His eyes squinted against the glare and caught the character of the rock before he was able to distinguish details. And in the black limestone, big disks of gray mineral had been set. Jets of flame played upon them and turned them to blazing, brilliant white. The big yellow mole man who had carried him dropped him roughly to the floor and backed away. About him the red guard was grouped. Rawson caught a glimpse of hundreds of other thronging figures. The crowd about him separated. A space was cleared between him and the farther end of the room. A lane lined on either side by solid masses of savage reds. And beyond them, more barbaric than any figure in the foreground, was another group. Across the full width of the room a low wall was raised three or four feet from the floor. It was capped with rude carvings. The whole mass gleamed dully golden in the bright light. Beyond the wall, in a semicircular formation, resembling a grouping of bronze statues, were men like the one with whom Rawson had fought. Priests, tenders of the fires, he knew in an instant that here were more of the Red One's holy men. They stood erect, unmoving. At their center was another seated man-shape that might have been cast from solid gold. His naked body was yellow and glittering, contrasting strongly with the black metal straps like those the warriors wore. On his head, a round, sharply pointed cap was ablaze with precious stones. Rawson took it all in in one quick glance. He knew that those copper bodies were not encased in metal, for the flesh of the one he had fought with had sunk under his blows. Their skin was coated with a preparation, heat-resistant without a doubt and the golden one must have been treated in somewhat the same way. His thoughts flashed quickly over this. It was the face of that seated figure that riveted his attention. A white face, milk-white, so white it seemed almost chalky. For one breathless second, Rawson was filled with a wordless hope. The white ones of his dreams had looked upon him with kindly eyes. They were human, men of another race, but men. Then, beneath the chalky whiteness of the face, he found the hideous features of the red mole men, and he knew that the white color of the face was as false as that of the golden body. But he was their leader. He was someone of importance. Rawson had started forward impetuously when he saw the figure rise. At the first motion, the hands of every red one in the room were flung in the air. They stood stiffly at salute. Even the priest's coppery arms flashed upward, and fee e all a thousand shrill voices were shouting, fee e all fee e all Rawson stopped, then walked slowly forward, one defenseless naked man of the upper world, between two living walls formed by men of a hidden race. fee e all he was thinking. He's the one I saw coming into their temple back there. They got out of our way when they knew we were coming to see him. He's the big boss here, all right. He did not pause in his steady forward progress until his hands were resting upon the golden barrier. Strange thoughts were racing through his mind. Fee e all. He was facing Fee e all, king of a kingdom ten miles or more beneath the surface of the earth, a place of devils more real and terrible than any that mythology had dared depict. And he, Dean Rawson, a man, just one of the millions like him, up there in a sane, civilized world, was down here, standing at a barrier of gold, before a tribunal that knew nothing of justice or mercy. Thoughts of communicating with them had mingled with other half-formed plans in his racing mind. Sign language. He had talked with the Indians, he might be able to get some ideas across. He met the other's fierce scrutiny fearlessly, then, waiting for him to make the first advance, let his gaze dart about at closer range. He could not restrain a start of surprise at sight of his own clothing, his pocket radio receiver, and his pistol spread out on a metal stand. They had been curious about them. Rawson took that as a good sign. Perhaps he had been mistaken in his interpretation of what he had seen. For himself, he could have no real hope, but it might be 
that the outpouring of these demons into his own world was a threat that lay only in his own imagination. His eyes came back to meet the gaze which had never left him. The eyes were mere dots of jet in a white and repulsive face. The rounded mouth opened to emit a shrill, whistled order. In the utter silence of the great room, one of the copper-skinned priests moved swiftly toward the rear. There were chests there, massive metal things afire with the brilliance of inlaid jewels. The priest flung one of them open with a resounding clang. The room had been warm, and the chill which abruptly froze Rawson's muscles to hard rigidity came from within himself. Dreams? He had thought them dreams. Those marching thousands, and the others who returned? He had dared the hope he might avert an invasion by this inhumane horde. And now he knew his worst imaginings were far short of the truth. He saw clearly his own fate. For the priest returning was holding an object aloft, a horrible thing, a naked body scorched and charred, and above it a head loped awkwardly. The hair was sandy. Half of it had been burned to the scalp in a withering flame. Below, staring from sightless eyes, was the face of the man who had once been the sheriff of Cocos County. End of chapter 12